Gary Jarman is the lead singer and bassist for The Cribs, one of my favourite bands. I've had the pleasure to get to know Gary over the last few years, and here he tells us about his career and life in the music industry. He wears the black drums with red trim, his professional record, 34 victories with two defeats, 24 wins by way of knockout hailing from Hey Andy, how are you doing, man? <laughs> how you doing, man? I like the beard. Oh, and well, I actually just trimmed it because it was getting a little, it's getting a little too much. I mean, it's just the this, the, the whole psychology of like when you're staying home and you just don't you don't really care because no one sees you, <laughs> so you end up growing a beard. But then the flip side to that is um, beards just remind me of being depressed because like it just kind of it's it's almost like it's almost like getting from not taking a shower. It's like, if I did that, I would be depressed all day. And so not shaving, like, my wife prefers me to not shave. So this is an excuse to not do that. But I, I don't know, it's something emblematic of it being like, like I've just given up or something. So I don't know. I don't know. And can you see me on the screen? I can see you now, actually. Yeah, I couldn't, yeah, well, but no, I can't. I wonder what my beard says about me. <laughs> it, it, <laughs> it, it's good, man. It's a bit of both, I think. A bit of both, what you said. <laughs> I, don't, I, don't know if it's, I don't know if it's a regulation, if, if the commission would have you trim that or not. Yeah. So, uh, I remember when uh, Ray Leonard fought Duran. Angelo Dundee was very clever, you know. He made uh, Duran shave his beard off the day of the fight. He made a big fuss yeah. about it not being sanitary, the beard. Yeah. And that kind of upset Duran. <laughs> I think I think I really don't think it would make that much difference from a cushioning point of view, but because um, you hear that sometimes, don't you? But I can't yeah. imagine that it would. But I'll, I don't know if it cushion, but I think like if, especially when you're in the clinches and you like rub your face against somebody, it's not very pleasant. Yeah. You know? I yeah, always yeah. used to like to leave a bit of at least a little bit of stubble anyway. I don't know. Did you hear that about um, what's his name, James Kirkland? He was like, he said that he would never shower for like a month <laughs> leading up to the fight, yeah. which is which is really gross, obviously. But I mean, yeah, there's no rule against it. I, like, I wouldn't, <laughs> you wouldn't want to fight Kirkland anyway. Yeah, like, yeah. Especially, especially in, if he was like really super gross like that. It's pretty. It's almost like uh, chemical warfare or something. Yeah, it'd make it as unpleasant as possible. Yeah. Um, Gary, thank you very much for joining us uh, today. And uh, what can I say? That's a spectacular background. <laughs> Are you yeah, in your recording well, studio? I'm in my basement, yeah. And, and there's no natural light down here. So, um, well, there used to be, but I, I, I had to board all the windows up to, to make it more soundproof. But uh, yeah, so just kind of some mood lighting, really. I really like it. Like, it's like, I, I'm just almost like a kid or something. It's like, I get, I've got my own studio. And so I can make it um, exciting <laughs> and, and like 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 a childhood dream or something. But yeah, really, it's just a basement with some uh, fairy lights up. And you're in Portland, Oregon. How how are things there with lockdown and 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 the virus and everything yeah, else that's going it, on? Well, it's funny because um, my brother Ryan, my twin brother, he's in New York. He he lives in Queens, and um, he's you know which is the absolute epicenter of uh when it was kicking off in new york and i would speak to him every day and he was you know pretty traumatized by it he's still quite traumatized by it um because of how oppressive the city was and how on his doorstep it was but but here we were doing really well for a long time and uh and it was beautiful weather and there's lots of space so like it, it, it actually felt i actually felt quite privileged like that that it it that that we were spared the worst of it, but I, I have heard that um, with us being, you know, sharing a border with uh, California and Washington, which have both been pretty badly affected. Like, I, you know, some people are saying that it might just be a matter of time before things uh, things ramp up here. But is it for the most part so far? It hasn't been that bad, um, you know, outside of the the fact that everyone everyone. Everyone's modified the behavior anyway, mm. so so it, people are being responsible, and that, that that that's that's good. Yeah, I feel like Oregon would would be that type of state that people would have. Yeah, some people sort of, took mm. people took to it quickly and been looking after one another. But um, you know, it's 
it's been a long time so like and the and the sun's come out so like some people naturally are you know relaxing a little bit as as you can expect but i mean for me it's like that that cliche thing of like everyone saying oh i was a recluse anyway so it was fine i mean yeah i i was pretty reclusive um so it hasn't i i do recognize that i'm pretty lucky i can work from home i can i can do stuff from home but um so i try not to be too judgmental of people but um politically this state is is uh is 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 uh you know we're not when we're, we're looking out for one another so mm. that's as much as you can expect at this point i know it's been a long time like it seems like years ago since we were having those calls early lockdown it really, <laughs> checking it in really with each other does, man. it really does and and i was thinking about it the other day because uh, um obviously the last i heard from you is when you had you uh when maud had your son i i i don't know what, what's your son's name um i've called him andy um andy yeah cool man <laughs> that's awesome yeah i called him andy o'day lee um right this is the first time i've actually said his name in public so uh yeah, thank oh, you. Oh, wicked. Well, I'm sorry. I didn't mean to be presumptuous. <laughs> no, no, it's fine. Anything, I, but... Like, you know, it's 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 a family tradition to name the first yeah. son after the dad in my family and for, for generations. Um, but it's not the done thing these days. And even when, like, no, but we had a several names. Think... Like, we had, we must have six different names to call him, all names we like. But then when it came to it, it was just, there was no other name I could really call him or feel comfortable with. And, I, mean, I feel bit... like in the boxing community, it's a big uh, like it's it's kind of more prevalent too. You get a lot of juniors in mm. the in the in the boxing community. I don't know if that's anything to do with it, but um, I like that sort of lineage stuff when when it comes to the the boxing stuff anyway. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I was just saying, like I was mentioned recently, that like a lot of juniors who turn pro, they're never as good as the dads. You know, they right. never end up doing the same things as that. I can't think of one one. One example of a junior, maybe well, Floyd Mayweather Jr. Floyd, is the only yeah. one, yeah, Floyd. Um, but he's an outlier in every sense of the word. I think I think it's probably, I mean, it's probably to do with the fact that they were pushed into it. You mm. know, it's like you're carrying a you're carrying someone's name, so they maybe kind of get pushed into it. Yeah, or the fact that their dads are rich and successful and famous, and the kids don't have to have the same experiences growing up as they did because uh, yeah, they've been afforded that's true, the better yeah. lifestyle, you know. That's that's very true for sure. Mm. How, you know, how did you end up in Portland? It's, it's like it's a far departure from Wakefield. Yeah, it's a it's a pretty simple story. Like the the so it's two thousand five. The Cribs were touring like a lot. Like one of our big reasons for being a band was that we wanted to. You know the, the classic thing you just dream about getting escapism like escaping your city like broadening your horizons stuff that's like maybe a little less um a little less of a focus for kids now because you have escapism through your phone you can connect with the world a little bit easier but like for us like we just really wanted to get out and explore and we so the first few years of the cruise we toured relentlessly and we were pretty nomadic we didn't live anywhere we didn't really care about you know going home or stability or whatever but then we were on tour in uh europe with Stephen maltmus and the jicks so Stephen maltmus is a front man from pavement and it was his new band the jicks and um me and me and joanna the bass player like we met on that tour we met in paris it was awesome you know like it was the first day of the tour and uh touring's a funny world because you spend you spend like a month in close proximity with people you've never met before and you're with them every day you know it's it's a highly unique situation and um yeah romance was blossomed between me and joanna their bass player and uh it, it's funny you get to you get to the end of the tour it's kind of like last day of school you know it's like you just don't know when you're going to see one another again so i just took the plunge and was like i'll just come out and visit and uh, I just kind of never, never went home, really. Uh, that's that's it. I've been here since 2005. Wow. Uh, no, actually, 2006 is when I first came out here. Yeah. I've been here ever since. Um, so, yeah, it was <laughs> serendipitous, really. Yeah, and it really changed my life, you know, because at that, that time, 2005, I was really, like, living hard and just like you know you, you you get it's it's part of the music industry in a lot of ways that the work you had and, and you go on tour and it's 
it's unhealthy but that's why and a lot of people burn out from that and it's almost expected and to be honest me and me and my brothers we went into it we we grasped the net or we really wanted to like live that life and, and we saw i think in the back of your mind you always expect yourself to burn out at some point because you just you know it's the way it tends to work and and so when when we met like it, it made it actually was like a really good time for me to get some kind of uh, you ready for the change stability in my life yeah there's something to work towards you know mm. like it's like you can't you can't just move overseas it's not that easy i had to like really get my act together you know and uh and yeah and it was really cool i came out here there's like great music community and i was embraced as part of it straight away and so i never i never had that weird feeling of like leaving people behind because I'd, I'd, I'd been on the road for so many years that, and nomadic anyway that it it never felt it never felt strange or anything uh you mentioned obviously your brother ryan is in new york and your brother ross is he still in wakefield he's still in wakefield mm. yep and so how does it work when you guys are writing songs or writing music or even now trying to record well, or like if you're trying to record with, with like three different time zones yeah the time zones doesn't matter that much, really. I mean, but it, I do miss. We used to we used to be so autonomous. We had a studio together in Wakefield, like a big space, and we all lived together, and it was really cool because like we would just you know we'd spend all our time together. We were very, very uh, motivated and and driven, and the studio was cool. But then. Now it's now the technology's made stuff easier because now like it, it's pretty it's pretty common to record digitally and send each other songs and 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 uh, and have people work on things remotely like that has like kind of saved our ass in in some ways but like but I think I I I, I do miss the the communal vibe that we had together but in some ways I do think we might have burned out quicker you know it's mm. like maybe this is like maybe this has helped preserve the relationship a bit because you know it's it's i love i love what i do but it's not plain sailing a lot of the time um there are this that's why i enjoy talking to you sometimes andy because i think there's a lot of parallels between the the industry you were in and the industry that, that i'm in like it's like you love it and and, and you want to do it but you you also like you know you yes. know that it's not just all glamour and it's not straightforward and like you have to like look after yourself and 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 you have to get involved in stuff that you don't necessarily want to do at times so i i feel like if we'd have all been together forever it might have burned us out quicker but maybe one of them maybe would have been super <laughs> inventive and creative and like you know you just never know like and i've tried not to regret anything that we've done as a band because there's so many decisions we could have made differently mm which might have been might have reaped really good rewards or it might have just you know it might have just destroyed us so you just I, i'm i've become more philosophical over the years i think yeah it's hard it's hard to sum up those you know those decisions like with the yeah. parallels of boxing and, and, and music and like you said signing with this whether it be a manager or in your case a label or or a promoter in my yeah. case how those things might have played out or worked out or yeah you... whether you'd have taken this gig or taken mm. that or whatever i mean we had a thing with warner brothers like we signed with warner brothers at one point and that was a big decision for us that we didn't take lightly but we are we also like we 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 had a pretty strong hand at the time and we we we, we put some pretty major restrictions on what warners could do um you know uh we thought that was the right thing to do at the time and in hindsight, I'm like, I mean, if you hadn't have done that, like, you know, the 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 time, the 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 way that things were at the time, like, as far as the musical climate, like, you know, we were potentially sitting on a a a, a single that the U.S. that the U.S. label thought could be a big hit, and then we kind of tied the hands a little bit by not letting them work the record um, over in the U.K. where we were actually having big success at the time, so. You never know, the two things might have crossed mm. over, but otherwise, it, who knows? I mean, it's the kind of thing where it could have actually worked to our, uh, it could have like actually you, been a negative thing. Too. Yeah, well, like, like you've always stayed true to your to your values. Yeah. I I feel like that's one of the biggest things I respect about you and your brothers is that 
I'm sure there was a huge temptation by record labels or, or pressure by record labels to for you guys to not not to sell out but to produce commercial commercially accessible music. Yeah, um, for definite, and especially in that era. And it's funny because like in lockdown, I've been listening to a few podcasts of like bands from that era talking about their experiences, and um, it does make it's funny. It makes me realise like that what it, we felt like we were being radical at the time and that we were being very um not not difficult but we really held people at arm's length and it's funny because when i listen to these podcasts i'm like all oh, these bands that i thought were probably having a great time were actually having a pretty miserable time mm. and i think it's because because they were maybe having that identity crisis because I mean, the, things were so the, all bets were off at, in those days things were like you could be a band and get signed overnight essentially or like very quickly and then you know you straight into like radio one and like and 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 all that stuff because of the because that's the that's what people wanted at that time yeah, like, it was I'm, a always, hard... I'm always interested in how that happened like you started the band w- would have been what 2002 but you were playing together for since would you say your whole life you, you yeah and then yeah, just like you started the band sure. officially and then like how that from starting a band to getting signed i'm always interested in how that happens because you you see these acting oh yeah they don't really go into it too much yeah no and and when i was a kid and i would read um autobiographies or band biographies that was always the chapter that was most interesting to me like when the when you go from being you know these wide-eyed and innocent kids to like uh to 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 actually make having that breakthrough and and it is the most fascinating element and for us it was a i'd been in bands in the 90s and and it was a real struggle i was from a small town i had no means to get to like big cities and the the industry's all based out of london so i'd had that struggle where you literally play to nobody and uh and and feel you know it's, it's hard because you have to invest a lot of money into buying gear and going to rehearsal space and like you're just getting nothing back and so um you have to be really dedicated in that old analog world but then when the crib started it was it was it was funny because it was the total opposite it was like um 2002 the start of 2002 and that when we made our first demo and we didn't we didn't even send it off to anyone to try and get signed we 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 gave it to a promoter because we wanted a gig in sheffield and um he he handed it off to somebody else and it was one of the things like back in those days like record labels were so desperate to to find like a a british version of what was going on in new york or detroit at the time and like the strokes you know, or the stroke the strokes had happened which i think had taken everyone by surprise because they come out of nowhere and it really was like you know uh, causing a huge buzz and then the white stripes being a, an example from detroit mm. who were um, you know, they'd been around on Sympathy for the Record Industry, which was a small label, and the, you know, but again, like the the industry couldn't see like they, they didn't see it coming, and so all of a sudden you had like big labels who were like really, really trying to make sure that they cast a wide net and and didn't miss anything, and like you know, we had we had a pretty good story. We were three brothers from a small town, and we were kind of was there a temptation you know, for the band name to be the Germans? <laughs> oh man, there was there wasn't, but it should have been. It always should have been, and and it's still uh, like I still think about it because it was the it was a it's a good. I think it would be a good band name. And the Cribs is pretty what, good. What, well, the Cribs, it, it's it's okay. It's a little misleading. Um, it, it it made us sound a little more kind of hip than what than what we were. But I, I but I think the um, what happened was the Cribs was just a pseudonym that we made up because. Me and Ryan that we used to go to a uh, college in Wakefield, and they had a recording studio that we wanted to get access to to make the first Cribs demo, uh, or to make some of the first Cribs demos. And we uh, we couldn't book in under our own names because we'd left under a bit of a black cloud, and so we just <laughs> made up a band name, and that was it. And and then when and then when the band you know finally got going properly, we just thought it'd be a nice thing to keep that name from tradition, but. Yeah, it should have been the Germans, really. Absolutely. <laughs> um, but like, I mean, it kind of is the Germans anyway. So, whatever. You say like, uh, yeah, you were quite rebellious when you were like a lot of your music in those days was like 
like hey scenes does man's knees all above all public they are like a rebellion against what's going on you know in 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 the scene or whatever you know it, it's yeah uh, it was like we we were raised on punk rock and we were from a small town and it's it's hard to underestimate how big of an impact like you you uh your environment has it sorry it's hard to overestimate how, how much of an in, impact your environment has on you um i think things have changed nowadays again like i said because everyone's more connected up and everyone's more worldly but when when you grow up in a small town pre-internet it's it, it really had a big impact on us because you ne- you were always sort of told to stick to your uh you you would you having ambition and ideas of your station was actually like discouraged in mm. some ways because people thought you know you thought you were better than everyone else if you if you had aspirations outside of you what was expected of you so me and Ray, it was a bit of a gauntlet run when we were teenagers we were you know like our aesthetic would be like provocative to the locals and like and, and our ambition was also like a little bit great in as well and so like by the time like we we actually started doing well and people you know people were getting on board with us like you know we it was it's funny to go to like cities and have people who you've never met come to see you, you and your brothers like it, because it towards it just still feels like because because we, we are brothers it, it was it was an unusual feeling to know that people knew who your family were as mm. opposed to who your band was and that that's a that's a beautiful thing it's something i really appreciate but at the time when it was like, it was just like we would sometimes play these like trendy club nights and like and the, the you just felt like you were. Uh, I I'd never really liked that that idea that like you were part of a trend. So yeah, but it must be an amazing it, feeling that, like you're all adults now. Most adults like with my rules, we stay in touch, we talk through WhatsApps maybe every day, but we wouldn't have something that. No, as you grow old, you grow apart a little bit, and you don't have something that really yeah. connects you. Like, but you guys have the music, and you have those experiences, and you still have this common goal where you want to play and, and make music together. It must be. Yeah, and the best thing about it is, if it, to be completely honest, is like I've I've got to see pretty much the entire world, but I've done it with my brothers mm. too. You know, like to, so every when we would go on tour to like. Japan or China or, or you know, uh, Australia or uh, South America, like places that are quite far flung, we're, we're all together and there's that, that's, you know, you experience it together and then other stuff, like, we, you know, I'm lucky in the, f- I'm, I, I'm really lucky in the fact that I've lived some of my dreams, like, I, I as I'm sure it's the same for you, like, I, I, I always wanted to, like, like, for, like, boxes, like, you want to, People always want to go to Vegas or like or, uh, Madison Square Garden, and for me and my brothers, it was always we, we always really wanted to play uh, the Reading Festival because that's where we went to as kids and and where we'd seen our heroes play. And I've 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 got to play that festival numerous times. But I've got to play the main stage three times, and and it, I can still I'm so proud of that, and I experienced it with with the with other people who shared that dream with mm. me at the time. You know that that's amazing, and like. I can still just call my brothers up and chat about that. It's, 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 it, it feel that feels so good, but, um, but at the same time, it also makes it tough because when people criticize you or like, if you come in for, you know, if you get bad reviews or if you come in for like things that you think are unfair, you're naturally protective of your siblings as well. So you, you feel, you feel the negative stuff a lot harder too, you know, because it, it feels personal. It feels personal. Like I, I can deal. Mm. Absolutely, yeah. My ego can like handle stuff, but if I feel like someone's attacking my brothers too, then I'm it's sure like, they're the same know, in regards it, to it, you. It's true. No, it's true, and and it does. It does. It, it just means the whole thing's more heightened. The the highs are really awesome because you're with other people who understand it and other people that you care about, and you're happy for them too. But then the lows like will 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 hurt more, and then and then on a personal level, you worry about one another a lot as well because it's not it isn't a healthy lifestyle. So mm. I I feel like I'm, we're lucky we came through our twenties uh, healthy and 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 fit because I think those those first three albums are the real 
the real test for bands because you've given everything on a plate and like and, and you cast cast out into the wild just to do whatever you want and, and everything's facilitated. And that's that's when when you when you're finding your feet like that, that's when you're also most likely to get you know, uh, make some bad business decisions or whatever else because you, you're so high on just everything you're doing. You're also distracted. So um, mm. it's so uh, once I got into my 30s, it was sort of a little bit easier. But my 20s, yeah, I'm, gl- I'm glad we came through it. You know, Do you it's think easy that to going going through that like whatever those wild times? And you, th- you think that was because it's it that's what is expected of a rock band being given those I things think, or do you think that's that was what you wanted to do that was part of like because speaking to you now and me knowing you personally i don't yeah. see that wild <laughs> that wild no, guy uh, well you figure because you figure yourself out you know and uh, we we were like we were always a really principled band like we grew up on on hard well like, on punk rock mostly but like we all we always adhered to the kind of hardcore sort of doctrine and and uh we were really into Riot Girl and the manif- their manifestos and stuff. So we were a pretty principled band. We were never, um, you know, like that that sort of cliche kind of band. But we were definitely destructive, self-destructive. And uh, you know, part of it was like, yeah, I'd, I'd grown up. Um, I grew up my, my my heroes when I was a kid. Like Freddie Mercury was my first hero. He died in '91, and uh, and then I got into. I got into Nirvana pretty shortly after that, and then Kurt Cobain died in '94. And I, so I always, from from an impressionable age, I always had this idea that being a being a uh, signed musician was a treacherous kind of thing, you know, like like it, it it could be a threatening thing. But but I was sort of me and my brothers went into it expecting that, and we were kind of we were kind of okay with that in some ways. We thought it was a worthy trade-off, you know? <coughs> you knew there was some danger involved, but you just, you, you figured it was worthwhile. Um, and so we, 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 did, we did expect it, but then at the same time, yeah, the, 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 the way things work, it, it's not, it's, you do have to check yourself because it's like, you know, you, you, are, you are given free, drink or whatever it is you want every night i mean like literally on the rider you're given enough alcohol to like for like a week weeks worth of partying really and um you just bored you you're bored you don't know Mm. anyone in the city you sit in the dressing room and me and my brothers actually have a rule that once we've sound checked we never leave the dressing room because we did it once and, and the gig went badly so like we've we've always had this thing like when no matter where we're playing no matter how new to the, us the city is or exciting we, we always just sit in the dressing room after sound check so you just yeah i mean it's 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 hard to resist that temptation and we didn't like we we we, we did sort of grasp the nettle and then it's like you know it, it, at first it's it's the classic thing at first it's fun then it becomes a problem and then it becomes destructive and mm. uh you know you figure it out over time we're, we're lucky that we've been around long enough to to go through stuff and and you know become more worldly and not not get sunk by it i mean there's been moments where it's been hard for us like uh, usually luckily at different times so you know you yeah, have to support other. your brothers on yeah. the road yeah, yeah absolutely and that's great the three first albums the cribs the new fellas and then man's needs and then you're on like you're riding this crest of a wave, and then you then you start working with Johnny Marr comes into the band and it's total like left of field. No one saw that coming. How did that come yeah. about? Well, really, it, it it's actually I wouldn't say it's a mundane story because I, I mean it, it's actually pretty amazing, but it, it it was not nothing exceptional. So because I was out here and he was working with. Modest Mouse, who were f- like the drummer in Modest Mouse, was the drummer for Stephen Malmus and the Jicks when I met Joanna. So he was a really close friend of mine and my wife's. And he was working with Johnny, and I was at his house, and Johnny just happened to be there. I'd just got back from a tour. I'd been on I'd been on an, an arena tour around the U.S. with uh, Franz Ferdinand and Death Cab for Cutie, and I finished that tour and we finished it up in Seattle, and then came back down to Portland. I mean. I look back now, it's kind of like a dream. I've just done this amazing tour and I got back to my new home and then we met. I met Johnny that, that day. And, you know, it was cool. It was like, it's so flattering because he was like, he just came up to me and was like, oh, uh, 
I really like the Cribs. So I've heard her since this on the radio and I've been a fan ever since. And I was like, it's amazing to hear that from anyone, you know, from anyone. It's like, it, I love the personal stories of how people get into stuff. But then when it's from somebody like Johnny, who like, you know, we admired growing up mm. and uh, who's widely considered a legend, it's like, again, it's similar for you. Like, you know, when you get to the Cronk gym and there's Tommy Hearns there, you know, and, uh, in your in your corner, you know, and like, and he knows, knows all about what you're doing. It's like, it's really flattering. And, um, and so I told Ryan, it was cool. It was somewhere in Portland. I was just like super psyched. I was like, man, everything's going so well. I phoned Ryan up because I knew he'd be happy about it. And he was, he was buzzing. But, um, the next time I saw Ryan, he's like, oh yeah, I saw Johnny at an award ceremony, by the way. I asked him uh, if he wanted to work on some music together, which was like classic. Like he took the ball and ran with it, you know? But then Johnny was down for it, and those guys started hanging out together in Manchester at his house, just like hanging out and writing. And then uh, I came over, and it's, it, things came together dead quick. So we mm. ended up making an album. It was not like it wasn't really intended. It was just fun, and it went really fast. And um, we we were really close. And, and in in other ways, it, that was that was a help for me as well because I think I was 29 at that point. So when he joined, it did you know it did help to get us, I don't, it, it was, you know, we didn't, we wanted to be, uh, we wanted him to be comfortable on the road with us. So I think we started to, you know, you start to be a little bit more conscientious and like, he's quite health uh, oriented. He, he does a lot of running and stuff. So mm. it, it was helpful in like, you know, in keep helping us to keep a check on our mod sort of, destructive self-destructive per, uh, parts of our personality as well so it was a trans you know how it helped coming that. into the band like i don't know it it definitely changed the sound of the band it had to i, I suppose with, with him being so influential um yeah because otherwise there's no point really yeah. you know it's like it's like it, it would be it would be silly if like we had him in the band and we tried to come we we tried to like convince him to 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 play by our rule book just like in the same way it'd be ridiculous if the cribs had all all of a sudden turned into johnny's mm. you know like some like just, just ended up sounding Open like what, whatever he was doing right yeah so we want a both elements in and and that that's the thing i'm most happy about with that record i feel like it was a success because um because you can hear it's like it's like you can you can see the hybridization, which I think is cool. We gave him enough room to allow him to do what he wanted, but but we didn't. Mm, so is, is, is that album on, not on even? Is that like a is that a standalone album? Do you, do you consider it that, or do you consider it? It's a bit of an outlier mm. in some ways. I mean, it's it's part of our lineage, and and it's not, there's something really again I, i'm quite romantic about these things but there's something amazing about when you work with somebody you're tied to them forever you know so yeah. like johnny and then lee ronaldo from sonic youth he, he was a huge hero of mine growing yeah. up and like you're tied to them forever because you've made something you know and like yeah. and there's something like about that like how again, did that come about never him, take that be, off him being on be safe how did that come about we, well with lee it it so our manager in the United States is a guy called Mark Cates, who um, he's worked. He worked at Geffen back in the day. So he, you know, he was part of um, he's part of Nirvana's team. He was part of Sonic Youth's team. He's got like an incredible pedigree. He worked with the Beastie Boys a lot, ran their label, and um, he started managing us like just right at the end of the New Fellas campaign. And um, so when we started writing men's needs he was we were talking about producers we just signed to warner so we had a bit of money to, to spend on a producer and um warners were really pitching us on like green day's producer and um who was it the green day's producer and, and some 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 other like big kind of uh, maybe like uh the, the blink 182's producer actually um and and so and we were we we didn't really want to go down the the route that Warner Brothers wanted us to go down, so we were like, uh, I I just I just finished reading a Bass in Thailand book where Bass in Thailand had just signed to who are a band I love by the way from uh, from being a teenager, and um, they just signed to Warner Brothers and they they got 
Lira and Outlets produced their record for Warner Brothers as like a, a compromise, like a middle ground. And so that was my that was immediately my first thought. I was like, we should get Lira and Alda to do it then, because that record sounds great. And uh, we thought Warners might know where we were coming from. And so we did speak to like so I was nervous getting getting my our manager to reach out to him because you know he's such a hero of mine. But um, he couldn't like he, he was. We were talking about him producing it, and we were talking to his engineer and stuff. And then we went on tour with Alex uh, and Franz Ferdinand and. We just got on like a house on fire, and by the time we got back from that tour, we decided that we were going to work together on on that record. So that kind of that never really got off the ground. But then, because we had that line of communication open with him, I was like, "Look, we've got this song. We don't really know what it's going to be. It's like it, it's kind of experimental. Um, we're a big fan of your poetry. Would you like to put some words on it?" And it, he just we sent him a really rough room recording of it, and he emailed back. I actually just shared the email on Twitter recently. We did one of those Tim Burgess listening parties, and the email is just pretty simple. He's just like, "Yeah, the song's cool, man. Like, uh, what do you want me to do?" You know, and it was that simple. Mm. I, lo- I love it. You know, it's like working with somebody that you that that much of a fan of, and and they're just like, it's that simple to. It, it, again, it wasn't any hassle. It was just like, "Yeah, I, I'll do it." Like, what do you want me to do? And then we got together in we. We recorded in Men's Needs, the album, in uh, Vancouver over Christmas 2006. And then I came back to Portland and had Christmas here and then flew to New York uh, start of January to mix the album with Andy Wallace. And um, we, booked a, we booked a studio for one day and Lee just showed up that, that afternoon and we, we just did it. And it was <laughs> ace. We had no idea. Like, no one had any idea if it was going to work, if it was going to be... I was really scared it was going to be embarrassing because I was like we had the song we didn't really know what we were doing with it and i was like we might get in you know there's always a chance you're going to get in a room together and we're going to be showing it to him he's going to be like man i don't know what to do with this 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 is i'm not feeling it or whatever you know and you're paying for like an expensive studio so but you know with the sometimes you just got to take that that gamble and i just thought blagging it acting like i knew what i was doing and and it worked out and it was really just like we did two takes of it, I think, and I think we, I think the one on the album's the, the first take. I think it was pretty much, it the, was, uh, it came my, uh, was what it was. The song came in my anthem for like the lockdown and the virus, like just be safe, be safe, be yeah. safe, be safe, be no, safe. No, and it's a, it's a buzz, man. It's like again, just like anything like that. It, it's really helped because like you, you feel isolated in lockdowns, but like the thing that matters to me more than anything, like I've said, is like. It's just all these like little individual stories that people have, and we yeah, did. Like so we did, did a. You did over the lockdown. You did two two of Tim Tim Burgess listening parties over Twitter. Yeah, and, yeah. Uh, you know, we talked before and after it. Like, how? What was it like? And I know, like, for in preparation, you're quite anxious. Yeah, I was really nervous, and and it's 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 hard to it's hard to explain, but. It's an extreme experience. It's like, and I've, I've, I've messaged with Tim about it. Like, it's 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 pretty. It's it's quite beautiful, really. It's like, it beforehand, I got really nervous. Like I would before. I, I don't get nervous before gigs, I have to say, but I got nervous in that fact that I was adrenalized because you know you're about to engage with a lot of people, and a lot of people are in the record for the first time, and you want. I want to make sure that we do a good job of it and that and that we're good hosts and everything but when it starts man it's like it's so quick and it's mm. so intense and there's so many messages coming through that you don't get a chance to read them and you're trying to keep up and you're trying to you're trying to put your thoughts down you know on your phone uh to to relate to people and it's funny i don't want to be too hippy about it but that shared experience and the fact that it's all it does feel like a gig with the adrenaline but the fact that Every person's reaction is individual, and you can actually go back and see and ex- and, and 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 read that. It, it's it was really cool, and I I was buzzing I was buzzing from it. At the end of it, it took me a little while to like relax because it was so adrenalizing, and it did feel like a gig. You have that calm down afterwards. You get messages from people saying, "Oh, that was cool." Like I got a message from you saying that, and that's kind of like a show yeah, as well. It was well. like, like um, cost... I've like I've I've done a few of them, the, the listening parties, but. The, yeah. Certainly, your ones were the ones that po- people. I think people most connected personally with the band and with the music. 
That's really nice. And, and, and we did put a lot of thought into it to make sure that instead of just being like, oh, I wrote this song by creating a loop and, and sitting at my, you know, mm. sitting at my computer or whatever. We wanted it to be like what's and all, really. Like, so, like, you know, just like the minutiae of the details and, like, things that, like, would otherwise not seem that... Um, I, we didn't want to talk about the, the technicalities of the recording or, or, the, or, the, or, the, or the, you know, because everyone's heard the record. They can experience that themselves. I wanted people... We wanted people to know what the what our state of mind was when we were doing it or like, you know, what, how, what we were living at the, at the time. Cause I think that that's more important, but yeah, afterwards you get like well wishes and stuff like a show, like that's the same as a gig, you know? And, and, and then I told, I told Tim about it. I was like, I had sort of a residual high for a couple of days afterwards. Cause there's still so many messages to go through and I had nothing to do. I was like in lockdown. Just like, it was just like, a few days of just reading through stuff mm. and just being really, just being really, it was move. It was quite moving to be honest. It was, it, it was, it was great. I, I love, I love individual stories, no matter how mundane they are. Like someone just the other day, like when it was the new fella's birthday, someone was like, "Oh, I remember the day this came out. I bunked off, bunked off school and went and bought it at the record shop and you know listened to it that whole summer or whatever." And it, like that's the kind of thing that really resonates with me because that reminds me most of like what it was like for me and Rye when we were growing up as kids. So mm. we used to save our dinner money to buy, we didn't have any source of income, so we'd save our dinner money to buy an album. And even if you didn't really like it, you had, you'd gone hungry for a week to get that record. So you, you really made the effort with it, you know? And But I, that's the stuff that really resonates with me more than anything. I'm going to tell you a like personal story. Um, can you remember when you were playing it? Uh, Irvine Plaza, what year was that in New York? Irvine Plaza in New York, uh, 2009, was... 2010, just at the start. Of uh, I'm walking through like uh, Washington Square Park and I meet some English lads there, chatting to them. I said, what are you doing over here? Oh, we're going to see the Cribs tonight. So, all right, where is it? <laughs> so we walk up there about 6 p.m., me, my then girlfriend, now wife, her sister and another guy, and his tickets are sold out, can't get in, no way. So I said, no. This is not good for you because you didn't get the ticket money. But I said to the bouncer, listen, <laughs> if I give you a few quid, can you get me in? He says, yeah, go ahead. So he, he gives me wristbands. And we get in, we've got different wristbands from everybody else that I'm seeing. So I said, oh, these must be like special kind of wristbands. <laughs> so the gig is amazing. And we hang around. And like, I just walked to the, to the change room door with this wristband. like, And all of a sudden, the door opens. So I said, come on in. So we all, we're all in the dressing room. So we basically crashed your dressing room. And... I think you guys came out come out from off stage and uh, I guess I know what it's like for there's probably always people hanging around there, so you didn't know who we were or if we meant to be there or who we were yeah and uh, it wasn't long before you figured out whether we weren't meant to be there <laughs> and you, were, you were totally cool like you weren't like get out of here no no one was no, like uh, it was just like um Oh, I think we realised we didn't want to overstay our welcome either. So no, when like, you were yeah. saying that, it was making me paranoid because I'm like, I know personally that I'm I'm so like, especially after a gig, I'm so like kind of uh, like like I get I get wound up and then I get sort of like like absolutely exhausted and I was like, I really hope I wasn't like, you know, uh, rude no, or anything. No, it was anything, fine. It was but... you guys were, were, were really really gracious, and even Johnny Marr was as well. So yeah, really, really well. It's cool, and it's so funny because I remember that night so well, and I have—I don't really have any recollection of that. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's, no, funny. Yeah. it's funny that yeah. you were there because I remember it so well. It was a good tour that one, actually. It's a great, like, great in gig. General. Great gig. I'm glad, man. Yeah, yeah. I—I I actually have a personal story for you. Um, so, um, so the way that the way that we connected with you in the first place, Andy, was. Um, we were in the studio, we were in the magic shop in New York recording our uh, sixth album for all my sisters. And uh, I'd, I'd got pretty pretty big into boxing by that point. I'd, I'd taken boxing up in 2012 as a way of like getting fit and trying to, you know, trying to like live a better lifestyle. But I'd been reading on the, before I'd flown out to do that, that record, I'd, I'd been reading about how you were lined up to face Karabov because I'd been following that story because that that story was there was a lot of twists and turns in that tale. Mm. A lot of people ducking Karabov, well, not ducking him, but you know, like people didn't really want that that Karabov fight, and there was a lot of twists and uh, twists and turns in it. And then 
I'd read that you you had the fight, and I was I was pretty excited about it. And I was like, uh, we were just in the studio. There's a lot of like downtime, and I was in the back of the room, and I was just looking at it. And on Twitter, I just noticed that you followed us, like, and so I just thought, oh, I can send him a send him a quick message. So I sent you a message just saying, you know, good luck with it all and everything. And then I tried to avoid the result because I, I I tend to record when I'm out of town, I record the fights and then come home and watch them, hopefully without finding out the result. And I was pretty nervous about that whole thing because Korobov at that point, he had that sort because of, we'd exchange a few messages in the studio and I was like, oh, Andy seems like a cool guy. And it was like, I, you get that sort of paranoia where you're like, oh, you know, he, he, he almost had that sort of Golovkin vibe about him mm. a little bit, did Korobov at that point. No one wanted to find him. He was a real technician and everything. So I got home from the studio. It was the first fight I watched. I was like, I was I was so thrilled for you at that point, and it was like, um, I can and it was a, I was sitting in, it was I was an, in Monaco. We were training south of France, not Monaco, on the border of Monaco, and uh, this band who I'd been following since I was like, yeah. <laughs> since I was in my early twenties, and it popped us with a message, and it it really was, uh, it was like, yeah, well, you gave me the, the the boost I needed to get through training that day, definitely. <laughs> well, that's and nice. maybe the fight, who knows. <laughs> <laughs> I'll take credit for it, yeah. No, but for for us, it was like, I mean, for me, actually, because my brothers were, um, you know, they, they weren't, they, they didn't really know the boxing at that point. And it, it, for me, it was like, I, I, I'd got into it so much that I was just like, it, it was just crazy to be able to, I was like, just the, the fact that I could send that message. Like, oh, cool, this is, mm. you know, it's flattering. So I, I sent you the message. And then the, the other story, I, I told you last time I spoke to you, like, remind me to tell you my Foo Fighters story. Yeah. So I've got a little story for you from that. So, we played with them a um, couple of years back at Manchester uh, Etihad Stadium. Um, and, uh, you know, we got to know them a little bit, like really nice guys. But then um, in the period of time after that, um, I read an interview on, on one of the boxing websites with their guitar player, Chris. He's a, because he's a, he's a big boxing fan and he's also a, he also does a little bit of boxing himself. So, um, so I'd read that interview, and then I was out in Los Angeles for a, for a couple of weeks, and, and I, I was hanging out with them again out there, and I wanted to find a gym because I was out there for a couple of weeks, and then I was like, oh, you don't know it. So I asked Chris, I was like, you don't happen to know of any boxing gyms around here, do you? So we got, we got talking about boxing, and um, he was asking me where I trained and all this stuff, and I mentioned that I'd done a session with you, and he was like, straight away it's like oh i love that guy he's uh nice. never in a bar never in a bar in fight like i love watching him fight and then we were talking about the um the quillen fight uh how how back and forth that was and and how much he enjoyed that and then he's also talking about the big comeback against karabov and stuff so yeah people, I thought like, you might, people I might thought... be surprised but like you are like seriously into boxing like you're like you're one I'm of the kinda, only people, like, non-boxing people, who I will speak to about boxing and really respect their opinion. Yeah, well, I, that, again, that's like super flattering. I, I tend to get, I tend to get into things like you study on a deep I, level. Yeah, I've got an all, I've got an all or nothing sort of personality. So when I started doing it, it was so difficult that I was like, I'm gonna have to do this properly, and I and I really enjoyed. I re I mean, the, I found it extremely hard at first, like coming from being just a you know, a musician who like toured and partied a lot to like trying to get fit in, in, in that way. But then, but then that, le that leads on to like all sorts of other interests. Like, you know, you just like, you start to enjoy watching it and, um, and like learning from it as well. And like, for me, it's like, I really take my, my interest in it was like a pretty latent one, like from back when I was a kid, like my, my grandparents were um, mainly the older generation of my family were really into it. And back in those days in the eighties, it was like, if it was on on a Saturday night, there was a big fight on. It's like like kind of everyone watched it, and I was they were like almost like superheroes or something. Those guys. It seemed like the most to me. It seemed like the most glamorous thing in the world, which is funny now because like you know I realised that the reality of it is it's very gritty and um, quite salt of the earth. But when I was a kid, I was just like I I, I thought it was the most exciting and glamorous. Thing I'd ever seen, you know. And that was before I was into music, really. But, um, but yeah, now I'm just kind of, kind of like obsessive. Like I get into something, I get mm -hmm. into it fully. And like when I was out, um, when I was out in Vegas um, with you guys for the uh, the Fury training camp, it was like for me to get in, to get to sit and talk to you over over lunch about um, tactics and and the technique and the stuff that you're working like. 
you know, I keep a lid on it, but at the time I was like, this is awesome. You know, like I was like, just to get that sort of insight about what's going on. And, um, mm. well, it was equally it, as fun for me. Trust me, just to have it, a, <laughs> one of my well, We talk about it a lot, don't we? How it's mm. like, it's like different, different worlds really. Yeah. But, um, but I, and I love to hear about your side of stuff. Like you like to hear about our side of stuff. And there are a lot of parallels and, um, you know, from the business side of things through to the, um, yeah, because like the, you've had a, you had a struggle there like over the last couple of years to yeah get back your publishing and yeah it was it was tough and mm. and I, yeah, I, I re, you know I read about I read a lot of um, boxing news and I read about a lot about people like who you know let's say somebody like Demetrius Andrade or like um, or Mikey Garcia a couple of years ago where they just kind of had to sit sit. Andre the Ward, out for yeah. a while. Andre Ward too. Like we have to sit things out for a while because they're dealing with stuff. And as a fan, you just like, oh, why do they just get on with it? You know, like you just want them to get on with it. But then, when you're on the other side of it, and actually reading your book as well, reading I got your book, um, Fighter, like for Christmas, and I read, I was reading that, and it's like there's a lot of similarities because you, you realise that sometimes that you can't move on until like certain things have been dealt with and, and it and it's put i mean it put us on ice for two years mm. so um i don't regret it we we did we did what we had to do but there were times where it was like i couldn't really imagine getting back into music because it was like it's hard to concentrate on on writing when you're so wrapped up in in when your head's in that side of the game and i sh- and I'm not sure what it's like as a boxer, but I should imagine that like if you don't feel happy with your deal and 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 and, and the way that you're being your career's being handled, it must be hard to like have that dedication to get up and do your road work at like six in the morning or like go to the gym and you know uh, work work really hard, not really knowing you know where it's going to end up. So like I can relate to stuff like that. Mm. Like. Did you think like when you started the band two thousand and two that you st- you'd still be going now? No, not really. I mean, no, it's no, hard no. To that you still be like, what is that to keep producing, to keep wanting to write music, and to keep, you know, to keep keep doing it? Um... See, I always want to do it. I, I've all I always wanted to mm. write, like, and I was always writing. It's like that's something that, like, even if I wasn't a musician anymore, I would still do it just because it's been such a big part of my life. And and like when I when I was growing up in Wakefield, it was it was purely escapism and an outlet for you know all my teenage angst. And then when I got older, and and I had a platform and as as a musician, it was like it was my duty then to, to like try and get better and try to like make the most of that opportunity because I never thought I'd have that opportunity. So I wanted to make sure I'd, you know, that I did as much with it as what I could. And each record you always want to get better and progress. But then, so, so now like, I feel like if it ended tomorrow, I would still do it because I would just mm. still, still feel, still feel motivated to do it because it's still, I don't, it, does it, it does still give you the same? Does it bring you the same joy? It does. Mm. It, uh, it really does. It, it, there's, there's. So, I don't want it to be cliche, but there's definitely. It's a way. It's one of your ways of dealing with the world when you've got so used to it. The catharsis that you can get from it, or the like, or it's the pride that you can get from it. Yeah, it's like sometimes I'll just come up with one bit or one section, and like. I'll think about it, like I'll list, I'll record it, I'll demo it, and I'll, I'll, I'll do something, and I, I'll think about it for like weeks. You know, really, that sounds crazy and maybe a little bit self-indulgent, but it'll just, it'll just be, it keeps, just keep me going. Like yeah, it just keeps like, me going. It's gratifying. Yeah, in sense. It's, it's, a, it's an amazing. It, it, when it, when it's when things are good, like it, it's really amazing. And I, I actually just like lockdown hasn't been that good for creativity because I've been. You know, it's hard to it's hard to like be enthusiastic when you don't know where where things are going. But um, I was really sad. Like last week, I had to have my dog put to sleep, which was which was crushing because I I, I loved her so much and like and um, uh, she was my baby really. But then but then the way that I dealt with it, I I, I did have this song that I'd been working on and like and I, I know it's I know it does sound a little bit cliche, but it really helped me because I. I could just focus my 
my grief into into like sort of getting something out of it and 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 that's really helpful and the other thing is now whenever i listen to it it it, it bookmarks that that period mm. of time and and i yeah it, i'm really lucky that i have that platform because when you that's when you meet people and they say like they like this song or they like that song it why it's so amazing because you're like man you don't know you have no idea what i was what what i was born out of so the fact that you get anything out of it whatsoever is like is amazing it's it's so it's so cool it's it really it really is cool mm. and that's why it's been hard to be on the shelf for like the last couple of years really so well hopefully it won't be for too much longer yeah well i mean who knows when when anyone's getting out i mean i was hmm. going to ask you actually is there any any news about when you might be able to get a training camp going or anything um because uh, you have to because you have to plan three months ahead at mm. least right yeah there's some talks of some fights coming back but nothing uh, well, one of the guys, Paddy, he's going to fight August 8th, so right. wherever he's done, but he's been training with his dad. And then yeah. Jason, we don't know yet, and and Tyson, we don't know yet, so... Is that, is that going to be in the top rank bubble? Mm. The yeah, it will be, it'll it? be a version of that over here in, in Ireland or in Belfast or in the UK. Mm. Right. Because I've been enjoying some of those some of those top rank cards, actually. I mean, it, there's been... A few of them have been, like, a bit lopsided, but um, so I haven't. Been some I haven't actually watched any of them. But there's been yeah. some interesting narratives mm. coming out. There's been some guys who've been really thriving in there. You know, just like yeah, guys club who are fighters who are not expected side. to win coming out and yeah, yeah, yeah and, that's... and I I love that kind of thing. Obviously, I mean to me that's like they're the narratives that are the most exciting. <laughs> you know, it's, you wouldn't know what the effect of not having a crowd there, but it's probably helping those guys. Yeah, not having to build up, yeah. not having their entourages or. You know, things to make you feel less... Yeah, it levels the playing field yeah, a little bit. Yeah, it does, yeah. yeah. Um, Gary, thank you very much for taking enough of your time. Thank right, you very cheers, much Andy. for joining us and for talking about your life and career. And uh, um, I really enjoyed it. I mean, it was, it's so different from the usual kind of interviews, you know, in, in some ways because of the the context. So it's... Yeah. Um, I think I think it was quite revealing. I was a little bit uh, a little bit misty eyed about the whole process for good. a little while. Good. Thank you very much, Gary. Thanks for having. Right, thanks, Sandy. Yeah, yeah. We'll talk soon. Thanks, man. Thank you.